Years ago, I took a course that I taught at Wheaton College and turned it into a book. And I called it the Sacrament of Evangelism. In sacramental theology, um, it is believed that God shows up somehow in a unique way in the sacrament, and through the sacrament is mediating grace. Well, if that's so, then I believe evangelism is a kind of sacrament. We don't take Jesus to anybody. He's already there, more interested in that person than you and I will ever be. And we get to go make explicit what he's doing implicitly. But that means we have to discover where he's working and move in that direction. So how do we discover this? And I believe that we begin by asking questions, public questions. And, and I learned this in, in, a, in, in a way where I was awkward. Um, and I believe if we're not awkward someplace in our life, we're, not just, we're just not growing. So it's okay to be awkward and learn from our experiences. But I, I sometimes would start off going too deep too soon with the questions. You ask a public question, you listen to the answer. In the answer, a person will give you permission to go deeper with the information they've given you. You can ask about that then, and so on. But here, I'll give you two examples, once doing it very wrongly, and the other time doing it better. The first time, I decided I needed to share Jesus with people, and I was going to go to a donut shop and share Jesus with people because people were just hanging out in donut shops. So I went at 10 o'clock one morning to a donut shop, and in America, nobody is in a donut shop at 10 in the morning except maybe a few policemen. <laughs> if you want to go to a donut shop and meet people, you have to go there from 6 in the morning to 8 in the morning where people are stopping off to get a donut and a cup of coffee on their way to work. And when I would go to this donut shop, I went every Tuesday and Thursday for about a year. And when I would go to the donut shop, I, I realized a person could write a, doctor, a, a doctoral dissertation on the sociological protocols of donut shops <laughs> and in, in the sociological substructures of donut shops. There were about 10 little tables in this donut shop, and I noticed that everybody would sit at the same table day after day after day. I didn't know how to break in. I didn't have a good strategy. I had a willing heart, but I was stupid. So what I thought I would do, this was my strategy, is I'd take my Greek New Testament, and I would sit down in the middle table, and I would be reading that. And somebody would come up and say to me, oh, what's that? I'd say, it's a Greek New Testament. And they would say, oh, can I ask Jesus in my heart, please? <laughs> I mean, that was about as effective as I was. But what I started doing, was I noticed that everybody sat in the same table day after day. So I started praying for the people. And, and there was this one guy who would come in, I'd say, hi, how are you, you know? He always sat at a table over here. And he was real grumpy looking like, like um, uh, uh, the guy that played in Grumpy Old Men, you know, the actor, Walter Matthau. Looked just like him, looked like he'd either been weaned on a dill pickle or baptized in lemon juice. This guy looked sour. <laughs> And day after day, I'd say hi to him. And one day, I was reading in my Bible, and all of a sudden, I heard a voice say, can I sit here? And I looked up, and it was the grumpy guy. I'd been praying for grumpy guy. He, I had him in my prayer, prayer. I had to erase his name and, and put down his real name when I got to know him. But I looked over, and somebody was sitting at his table. Somebody had come into the donut shop and didn't know the rules. <laughs> and so I said, sure, sure, what's your name? He said, Gene. I said, what do you do for a living? He says, why, you writing a book? <laughs> Okay, so I went too far too soon. But interestingly enough, every Tuesday, Thursday, Gene would come sit at my table after that. And over a long period of time, I found out that I probably knew Gene as well as anybody in the world. Twice been married and had no idea where his two former wives were. Two kids in the world and had no idea where his, former, where his kids were. Have you ever heard of a deadbeat dad? Gene was the guy. And you know God loves deadbeat dads? And sometimes we get to be the one to tell them if we find ourselves in their world. And sure enough, even though I started out very awkwardly, God gave grace, and over about a nine-month period, I was able to lead Gene to Jesus in the donut shop. It was kind of fun. But I learned from that. Don't go too deep too soon. So a few years back, I was on our spring break at Wheaton College teaching some C.S. Lewis seminars in Slovakia. And when I was done... I was driven to the Vienna airport, it's only about 45 minutes away, and it, from Bratislava, and I got through the uh, check-in, got my bags checked in, got to the gate, 
and my flight was delayed about three hours. It wasn't long after that that I saw this young woman come walking into the gate area. And she had a lanyard like we've been wearing this week, and she had a clipboard, and she was walking up to people and asking them questions and writing things down on the clipboard. I figured she was doing a survey for the airport, and she was speaking German. I could hear her. Vienna is a German-speaking city. And she walks up to me and addresses me in flawless English. And I'm thinking, what am I wearing that she knew to <laughs> speak to me in English rather than German? I said to her, what's your name? She said, Allegra. I said, Allegra, are you, it's a public question, what's your name? Are you from Vienna? Because she was in Vienna. Public question. No, I'm from southern Austria. What can I ask her? Where are you from? What brought you to Vienna? She said, I'm a student. What can I ask now? Where do you go to school? University of Vienna. What are you studying? Anthropology. And I said, do the rest of your family still live in southern Austria? No, only my father lives there, and he's very bitter. Well, what's he bitter about? Well, my mother left with her lover to Canada. Wow, do you have other family there? Well, my brother was there, but he's up at Vienna too. And then we started talking about her brother, and I found out she had no relationship with her brother. Her mother abandoned them. The father didn't want to talk with anybody. His life was so toxic. And then I found out eventually, too, that she had a boyfriend who had left to go to Florence to study art and asked her to wait dutifully for him for the six months he would be gone. He had come back the day before I met Allegra. And when he came back, he announced to her that he had met somebody better in Florence and dumped her. And her life was fractured and very, very broken, and she felt abandoned. I know where Jesus is showing up in her life. I know the issues. And this was 20 minutes we've had this conversation. She hasn't asked me one question for her survey. So I said to her, Allegra, I know you're supposed to ask me questions, but I've been sent here to tell you something. Well, then she thought I was a plant at the airport to see if she was doing her job properly. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it's nothing like that, but I was sent here. Oh, people, we are all sent into the world that God loves, where he's working. I was sent here to tell you something, but you do your survey first. How long did it take you to get checked in? How long did it take you to get through customs? How long did it take you to get through security? And so on and so on. <coughs> and then she said when she was done, what were you sent here to tell me? And I said, Allegra, the God of the universe knows you, and he loves you. Allegra, he loves you. A third time, Allegra, he loves you. The third mention of his love for her, she burst into sobs. Everybody's looking over that way. And she says, but I've done so many wrong things in my life. You know how Isaiah came into the presence of a God who's called holy, holy, holy? He wasn't told by the seraphim, sinner, sinner, sinner. He made that association when he came into some knowledge of the presence of God, some characteristic of God. And she heard God loved her, and she was able to make the segue about her need. And I was able to share with her in that airport. And I think that what happens is we connect the gospel most readily when we can connect it with felt need. Now, some people will say, well, wait a minute, felt need. Isn't that sort of anthropomorphizing the gospel? Well, no, who made us with these felt needs? We're working with the material that God has put in there. And it's good for us to be sensitive to this. And we can probably be best sensitive when we become more and more self-aware. How's God working with you? Is your need for Jesus a casual one? Or have you realized, no, your need's a constant one? My guess is if you're aware of your own need, you probably won't ever sound condescending to somebody else. And my guess is if you're aware of your own need, there will be some authenticity in the way you share because you'll see how important this is and how vital it is. And it will also keep you engaged because you won't think there's a world out there that maybe doesn't need God like you might think sometimes you don't need Him. And so we enter into that world and we try to speak the gospel in the context of felt need. Maybe sometimes it's through telling a story, too. Um, 
George MacDonald, uh, I mentioned this in one of the other seminars, George MacDonald, who, who influenced C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called Fantasties, and that book, when Lewis read it, opened up avenue to his heart. He says his imagination was baptized. But he wrote another book called Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, and in that particular book he said, we do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. He's no Gnostic. But he says if you tell a child he has a soul, he thinks like anything else he has, his keys, his books, his coat, he could leave it behind someplace when he goes off. He thinks when he dies, he goes to the grave and his soul goes off someplace else. But tell him he is a soul and he has a body, and he knows when he dies, he goes off to heaven and he leaves his body behind like clipped hair on a barber shop floor, for those of you that still use barbers. So what makes up the soul? I've done a lot of reading on it. I think I could set forth proofs for the existence of the soul. But traditionally, we've said the soul has a choosing part, the will. It has a feeling part, the emotion. And it has a thinking part, the reason. And I want to suggest to you that even coming from an academic environment, the reason is by far the weakest. By far the weakest. If I make a bad choice, my reason being weak, doesn't say to me, boy, Jerry, that was stupid when you did that. And if you continue down that path, all you're going to do is hurt yourself and hurt others who care for you. No, my reason being weak is marshaled by my will to make all kinds of excuses and rationalizations for the bad choice. What philosophers taking their lead from Aristotle's ethics calls acrasia or acrasia. This kind of rationalizing that C.S. Lewis described as continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Or as Paul said, we suppress truth in our unrighteousness. And that truth somehow stands before our hearts, C.S. Lewis said, like dragon sentries monitoring what will get to those hearts. If I'm hurt emotionally, my reason doesn't kick in and say to my heart, my wounded heart, you need to grieve what happened to you and you need to forgive the person who hurt you. So you can untether from that event and move on to wholeness. No, my reason being weak suppresses that wound, keeps it encapsulated in some cyst on my soul. You bump up against me, I'll bleed a little pus in your direction. And we can be so bitter years after some event happened to us, because we can't emotionally untether. Sometimes you talk to people about Jesus, and they're angry. They may say they're an atheist, but that's just masking the anger they have towards some Christian who maybe hurt them. Or maybe it's allowing them to project anger towards that person as an excuse for the moral behavior that they're choosing for themselves. And reason stands like those dragon sentries. How do you get past the watchful dragons, Lewis asks. Sometimes story does it. Sometimes. We all know that if we've read the scriptures. Nathan, the prophet, is given the assignment to go tell David he sinned egregiously. I don't know about you, but if I was Nathan the prophet, I wouldn't have liked that assignment. <laughs> because already David has not only sinned, but he's covered it up with murder. What's Nathan going to do? He goes and he tells a story. And he gets past the watchful dragons. And David's able to hear. So anyway, we encounter these people in our world. And maybe we use metaphors. Maybe we use stories of varying sorts. Um, C.S. Lewis said there's different kinds of metaphors. There's the pupil's metaphor, when we don't understand something. So we craft an analogy or a metaphor to help move us from the place of lack of understanding towards more enriched understanding. It's what scientists do all the time. They create hypotheses. That's an imaginative exercise to move them into regions they don't yet know. When they discover something in testing the hypotheses, they come up with models that are not the thing itself, but they're depictions. They help them. Um, uh, there's also not only the pupil's metaphor when we don't understand and we're trying to move in that realm, but there is also the master's metaphor. That's when we do understand and we want to craft an analogy to help others come into an understanding. You're talking to a person and you are coming from a different world. You're a supernaturalist. You believe God's at work in your world. You talk to him. If you said you were talking to an invisible giraffe, they would institutionalize you. 
And some people, when we say we talk to God, it must sound as much to them as if we're talking to a bunch of invisible giraffes. How do you take the person who has no supernatural awareness, really? They may, they may uh, at some level, but you have to awaken that in them. How do you move them from where they're at to this other place? Well, there's a master's metaphor where the person who knows can communicate and create an analogy that can bring the other person in. C.S. Lewis, in his own pilgrimage to faith, he had been an atheist. He had also embraced a supporting world uh, view of materialism. After he had reasoned his way through the morass of atheism and materialism and through agnosticism, he finally became a theist. And he said he didn't think he could know God personally at that point any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. He's reasoning this in the 1920s. It's the same decade when Luigi Perandillo, the Sicilian playwright, writes the play Six Characters in Search of an Author. These characters are on the stage, they're rehearsing, and all of a sudden other characters break in and they have this ontological or metaphysical discussion. Are there authors that exist outside of the world that we live in? And they come to the conclusion, no, and it ends in kind of despair, almost a prequel to the despair of the existentialists. That same, that same decade, Lewis is asking this question, that he couldn't know God personally any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. That's the pupil's metaphor, the guy who doesn't understand stretching. But interestingly enough, a year and a half later, he converts to faith. And when he converts to faith, he says he realized his analogy was a good one. But now he crafts it not as a pupil's metaphor, but as the master's metaphor from the place of understanding. And he says, in fact, if Hamlet could ever get to know Shakespeare, the only way it could occur would be if Shakespeare wrote himself into the play as a character and made the introduction between Hamlet and Shakespeare possible. In other words, there's an analogy of the incarnation. In, in, in some ways, you're bringing that message to people, but even if it's graspable, we're still not finished with the task. Let's all take a field trip. Let's go to Denmark. But let's not only go to Denmark geographically, let's go back in time to Elsinore. And we're going to come to the court of Hamlet. And we're going to take on the garb of courtiers. And we're going to enter into that culture. And we're going to discover some sketchy things have been going on. The king has died in the height of his strength. And rather than the crown going to the crown prince as it should, it went over to the king's brother, Claudius. And the queen, Gertrude, is hardly, hardly at all grieved the death of her husband and has married her brother-in-law. There are reports that the ghost of the former king has been seen in court. And even reports that Hamlet's talked with him. And Hamlet's been acting mighty strange, though some say there's a method to his madness. And Ophelia is a total basket case. And we're talking about these things in the courtyard, and all of a sudden there appears before us a little man in Elizabethan tights with frizzy hair and earring and a little goatee, and we say, who are you and how did you get here and pass the guards? Things have been strange and you're about the strangest of all. And he says, well, actually, I'm your creator. I, live, I created the world you live in. And I wanted to show up and tell you that, that I know things have been sketchy and goofy, but I'm, I'm, I'm here to set things right. And it's going to get better. And what do we say to that little man? Yeah, sure. In other words, the work is always still in process. Clarifications are always needed. And as we gain the information through asking questions of where this person is in their heart, we're able, by the grace of God, to shape the message individually to that person in that setting by the power of the Holy Spirit that we might invite them to somehow come into the rich understanding that they are loved by the God of the universe and they are forgiven. And by the way, if anybody's lived one moment of honest life, they know they're messed up. And the doctrine of forgiveness and the message of forgiveness is important. And if anybody's lived one moment of honest life, they know they long to be loved with a love that's ontological. God's love is ontological and that it's essential to his being. God is love. It's not diminished by my poor performance nor improved by my good performance. And we get to tell them. 
But now, in light of that too, I would suggest to you that the, the, the longing for the story is reverberating throughout our culture, constantly reverberating. You can hardly go to a movie that's well received without seeing it. Um, uh, take, let's take a filmmaker like James Cameron. Do you guys know his movies? I, I have seen him interviewed many times. He hates Christians. I've never s seen him in an interview where he doesn't take some sort of slam at Christians. And yet, he makes a movie called Terminator 2, where an alien from another world comes into our world and gives up his life to save a woman and her child. What's the next movie he makes? The Titanic. He spends $200 million to make that movie, more money than has ever been spent on a movie before. Boy, it better be a good movie because he's got investors he's going to be accountable to. So he makes a set a quarter the size of the original Titanic. He brings in great box office draws, Leonardo DiCaprio and, uh, um, beg your pardon? Ah, I can't believe it. My wife says my mind's like lightning. One flash, then total darkness. <laughs> um, Kate Winslet, Kate Winslet. And, and then he brings in Celine Dion when she's in her ascendancy musically. And he's got to tell a story now. So what story does he use? Of all the people who are on the Titanic, he uses our story. He's got a guy named Jack who wins a, a, a card game and gets a ticket to the doomed ship. And he goes to the doomed ship and immediately goes to the bow and makes a form of the cross and says, I'm king of the world. There's a woman stuck on that ship, played by Kate Winslet. Her father's died and left the family penniless, and the mother doesn't want to be a house cleaner. And so her only ticket, meal ticket, is to get her daughter married off to some wealthy guy, and this guy is like the devil himself. And she's stuck in circumstances not of her making, and there's a hopeless situation. She's ready to take her life, but Jack on that ship just happens to save her life. When they find the Titanic, this young woman is now an old lady and they bring her back and ask her to tell the story of that night on the Titanic. And she tells the story and they say, we have no record of him in the church manifest, or the, the, the ship's manifest. And she says, but isn't it amazing? He saved me in every way. This is our story and it gets to our heart. And the next movie he makes after that, what is it? Avatar. A guy who takes on the flesh of that world and enters into that world to save that world. Why does he do that? Is he intrigued by the story? Or does he know the story always works and he's a manipulator and he wants to tell a good story? I don't know. But all around us, this is reverberating. How many of you ever watched many Walt Disney movies? It's amazing to me how often Disney will turn to our themes. I remember even watching The Jungle Book with my kids when they were little. And I was surprised. I saw something in it I, I, I hadn't recognized before. Mowgli, the boy, is lost from his parents. He's raised by the bear Baloo and the Bagheera, the panther. Uh, Shere Khan, the tiger, wants to kill the man-child. And he comes, finally, after the movie, and there's this big showdown moment. And Baloo basically sacrifices his life to save the boy. And the tiger goes running off, never to be seen again. And there's the limp body of Baloo lying on the ground as Bagheera the panther and Mowgli the boy go walking off. Looking back at the body of their friend, Bagheera says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. I go, that doesn't sound like Kipling to me. <laughs> so I go looking up my jungle book, and it's not in there. Where is it? It's in John 15. Years ago, I was asked to come speak to all the Disney artists. Once a month, they bring in an outside speaker to keep them fired up about story. And I was asked to come talk about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and their vision of story. And I was told, whatever you do, we know these authors are Christians. You may have to talk about their Christianity where it's necessary to the subject. This isn't a place to proselytize. I say, I'm signed on with that. I know if I can get the artists interested in the authors. They'll keep talking even when I'm gone. I don't need to take advantage of the situation. But the people that asked me to come speak said, but if our artists ask questions, you can ask, answer any question they want freely. 
So I give my 45 minute lecture. They, the artists come in, they hand them a box lunch. They're sitting in this theater, about 350 of them in the round and I'm up in front and, and, and I give my 45 minute lecture, open it up for questions. First question, wasn't C.S. Lewis a Christian? Could you tell us about that? <laughs> Second question, wasn't it Tolkien that helped Lewis become a Christian? Could you tell us about that? Isn't Aslan in the Narnian Chronicles a Christ figure? Could you tell us about that? Are there any Christ figures in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, like when Gandalf dies, Gandalf the Grey, and rises as Gandalf the White? Could you tell us? Every question for the next 45 minutes had the gospel laced all through it. Meeting's over, the people go back to work, and about 20 of the artists come walking up, and I recognize them as the ones who ask the question. They say to me, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, are you? They said, yeah, why do you think we asked you the question? <laughs> <laughs> so then I said to them, okay, I have a question for you. How did greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, end up in the Jungle Book? And they said, oh, there's always been a group of us here putting things in film. <laughs> <laughs> and they put it in in a place of felt need. We've been moved by the story. And now something, but they also said, but there are other people here who've been putting other things in films too. It's a saw that cuts both ways. How do we reach felt need? Okay, so now, what we do is we ask the questions and as we go deeper with them, we craft our message to get past the watchful dragons to touch the person at the place of felt need. So we could clarify the gospel message, the love of God and his forgiveness. There was an author that I got to through C.S. Lewis, and her name is Evelyn Underhill. I even think if I would have gotten to Evelyn Underhill before Lewis, I probably would have made her my life's author. But she is a remarkable. Have any, any of you ever read any A.W. Tozer? Do you know that author? She is A.W. Tozer on steroids. This, this, she was a philosopher, first woman made, uh, uh, given university-wide lecture status at Oxford University. Uh, she was a philosopher of religion. She was a first woman fellow at University of London and so on. But in one of her books, she wrote this, that there are three deep cravings of the self, three great expressions of man's restlessness, which only mystic truth can fully satisfy. The first is the craving which makes him a pilgrim and a wanderer. It is longing to go out from his normal world in search of a lost home or a better country. The next is the craving of heart for heart which makes him a lover. And the third is the craving for inward purity and perfection which makes him an ascetic and in the last resort, a saint. So she talks about the pilgrim longing, the lover longing, and the ascetic saint longing. In the first book he wrote after he was a Christian, the only book that he wrote that was an allegory, C.S. Lewis told the story of a man named John who had a vision of an island and it sets him off on a quest. And in the midst of his quest, he comes to a, a hermit who represents history and he asks history about the deep longings of the heart. And history says, well, there's three big longings. Well, I would like to suggest if there's three, there could be 3,003. But there are three big longings and he situates the exposition of each of these longings in a period of history. He says the first is the longing that is the, 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 the longing in myth. And he puts it in classical times, Greek and Roman times. The second is the longing for the lady. And he puts it in medieval times. And the third is the longing for nature. And he situates that in romantic literature. So let's look at these because I think Underhill's Pilgrim, lover, ascetic saint are synonymous to Lewis's um, myth, lady, and nature. Let me play them out. First, myth and pilgrim. C.S. Lewis said it's the mark of an unliterary person that they read a book only once. I don't want any of you to beat yourself up. Some books aren't worth reading at all. And if you come to Wheaton College, where we have C.S. Lewis's library, I can pull off the shelf his copy of Don Juan by Lord Byron. And when he read the last page, he wrote the date that he finished it and wrote underneath it, never again. <laughs> at, least, at least he felt that book wasn't worth reading more than once. But how many of you have read Plato more than once? Oh, well. How many of you have read Dante more than once? How many of you have read any of the Narnian Chronicles more than once? 
Look at you literary people, you. How many of you have read any Tolkien more than once? Oh, you literary people, you. How many of you have read Jane Austen more than once? How many of you have read a Shakespeare play more than once? You literary people. How many of you have read propositional works like Mere Christianity more than once? Look at you literary people, you. Why do you keep going back to those books? It's like the child who hears a great bedtime story. And what does the child say after hearing the story? Read it again. Read it again. Why? And Lewis suggests that it's this. That book for the literary awakens in them a longing for the world that's been described. And it awakens them and touches them at the place where they long for the only other world they could ever really know, which is heaven. And he says it's a heaven longing. That means it's like a pilgrim longing. So you go read the Odyssey by Homer. What's the deal with Ulysses? He just wants to go home. He's been fighting in these wars. He wants to get back to Penelope and to Ithaca. But when he gets back, Homer does a funny thing with us. The suitors are there. It's a mess. He's got to set things right. Does that sound at all vaguely like The Hobbit? What did Tolkien name The Hobbit? The Hobbit or There and Back Again? He wanted to title it There and Back Again. The publisher said, no, he had to title it The Hobbit. He said, stick There and Back Again in because that's what this is about. You got Bilbo Baggins. Perfectly suited for journeys. He's got a great constitution for it. He doesn't even need shoes. He's got leathery bottom feet, hairy tops. But he likes his life in the Shire. Thirteen dwarves are looking for what? The reclaiming of their ancestral home. They're homesick. They want to go home. But there's 13. You can't have a quest with 13. You've got to have a 14th member because 13's an unlucky number. So Gandalf the wizard recruits Bilbo Baggins to be a part of this group. And reluctantly, he finds himself on this journey. And 18 times in that book, he's longing for home. First time he lays down on the hard ground, he longs for home when he can be back at his soft feather bed. The first time his provisions go stale, he longs for the fresh food in his larder back in the Shire. The first time they face trouble, the trolls, William, Tom, and Bert. This is Tolkien. He's got characters named Gladriel. Elrond, Gimli, Gandalf, but he names his evil characters, pedestrian names like William, Tom, and Bert, you know. What's the deal here? Anyway, he longs in that dangerous situation for the safety back home. Eighteen times when the adventures are over and he can finally go home, he comes over the hill, a poem pops right out of his mouth about his longing for home. And when he gets there, what? Just like in Homer. The Sackville Bagginses have declared him dead. They're dividing up his stuff. He tries to get it back. They say he's an imposter. It's all a mess. That's not the home. Tolkien uses it to awaken in his readers a desire for home. And it's a desire that beats in the heart of every person if we can talk to them and get our questions to that level in the discussion. In my age, in America, we have these reunions. You have your high school reunion and you want to go back and you go to the old neighborhood and the lots that you used to play games on have now got buildings built on them, the vacant lots, and the old buildings that were familiar have been torn down. And you go back and you see the elementary school playground where basketball at recess, the basketball games at the end of recess had high scoring games like two to four. <laughs> Because the baskets were so high up in the air, you needed jets to put the ball in the hoop. And when you go back, the basket's at eye level. And you see that big playground that you felt like you needed a GPS to navigate your way across it is now so cramped. How did we ever enjoy time in those small places? And you go back to the banquet, and they give you a name tag, and it's got your yearbook picture on it, because otherwise nobody else would recognize you. <laughs> All my old friends are bald and fat, with thick glasses and gray-headed. Life's been hard on them. I'm fine. <laughs> we go back home, and it's not the same. We're looking for some place that this earth can't ultimately give us. Before I move on to the others, let me give you another illustration. My son Jeremy, when he was 10 years old, he was often 
performing in plays at Wheaton College. If they needed a child in the play, I would get a call from then the theater director, Jim Young, can Jeremy come down and audition? He was playing in the theater adaptation of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. He played young Pip, and for the first third of the play, he had the majority of the lines. He's living the life of a college student as a 10-year-old, and he's in hog heaven. They go through several months, two, mo two and a half months of rehearsal. They go through 14 performances. And it was a world he came to love. And I go to pick him up after his last performance and he gets out of his costume and we go walking through the arena theater and it was at that moment he discovered for the first time the students don't leave the set until they've dismantled the set. And, and he was in existential despair. This world he had come to love is falling apart in front of him. He said, Dad, I've got to sit down. He looked like Obi-Wan Kenobi when that planet blew up and he knew there was a disturbance in the force. And he sits down and with despair watches us. And finally, after 10, 15 minutes, I said, come on, Jeremy, we have to go. And he shuffles out to the car like an old man. When we get to the car, he said, Dad, I just didn't want it to end. I said, oh, Jeremy, it's the nature of every play that it has to come to an end. It's the nature of every holiday and every vacation. It will have to come to an end. It's the nature of every year in school, it will have to come to an end. It's the nature of your childhood that it will have to come to an end. Maybe you're longing for the one thing that never has to end. And he looked at me and he said, do you mean heaven, Dad? And I say, yeah, heaven. God is wooing us to himself. This is not our home. And when in your questions you get that person to the place where you discover their own groping and longing, that Romans 8 experience where all of nature groans, now you've got a place to connect the gospel to. Deep felt need of a God who reconciles us so we could have confidence that one day we will be home. Second kind, lover lady. Love her lady. I remember in, in seventh grade in school, I was first told about Dante by Mr. Trejo, my seventh grade world history teacher. I can still see the yellow textbook. I can still see the picture of the Arno River in Florence and uh, Dante standing by the river as Beatrice Portinari walks by. And my teacher told me that Dante met Beatrice when he was a boy. He lit a candle in his heart for her. He kept the candle burning all of his life, even though he married somebody else, had his children by somebody else, and even though Beatrice died when he was relatively young, then he still carried this candle. And I thought, well, Dante's a chump. <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with him. And then all of a sudden, I like C.S. Lewis, and he thought Dante was the greatest poet ever. I like Lewis's friends, Charles Williams, who wrote a brilliant book, on Dante criticism called The Figure of Beatrice. I like Dorothy Sayers, and Dorothy Sayers uh, had a schoolgirl knowledge of Dante, but when Charles Williams started talking about Dante, she said, I need to go back and give this a reread. She gave it a reread, and she says, oh my, there's more here than I ever realized. She went and learned Italian so she could read it in the original and ended up doing the first language, uh, English language translation where she followed the exact rhyme scheme. Sayers, Williams, Lewis, all loving Dante, an off comment from a seventh grade teacher. Maybe I better give it another look. I read the Vita Nuova first. The ninth day of the ninth month of my ninth year, I saw Beatrice Portinari. What does she mean to him? What was breaking through in that very relational moment? He writes the Vita, the, the Vita Nuova when he's about 25, and it isn't for another 25 years before he writes the Divine Comedy. And in the Divine Comedy, it's Virgil, the great classical writer who himself had written about the pilgrim longing. We didn't even go into what the Aeneid was all about. And Virgil, who Dante thought was the greatest poet, leads him through the Inferno, leads him halfway through the Purgatorio. And it's at that moment Beatrice comes out of heaven and collects Dante and leads him through the rest of the Purgatorio, leads him on into the Paradiso to the very threshold of the vision of God. 
And Dante says, she turned to look, but not at me. It wasn't a human relationship she represented. She turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. She directed Dante's attention to the ultimate archetypal relationship. When C.S. Lewis's wife dies, he writes a book about his grief called The Grief Observed. You know what the last lines of that book are? In Italian, she turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. Human love is glorious and grand, but human love will never be able to do for you what only God can do for you. History is a story of people whose hearts have been broken by other humans. But all those loves, ultimately understood, are only a shadow of the archetypal love. Have you ever felt lonely in your life before? What does that tell you about your nature? If you felt thirsty, it tells you you need drink. If you felt hungry, it tells you you need food. If you felt lonely, it tells you you're a sociological being. You need others. The fact that you can communicate tells you you were made for community. But have you ever felt lonely in a crowd? Have you ever felt lonely living in close proximity, under the same roof, with people you care for and you know they care for you? It doesn't prove anything, but might it not strongly suggest you were made for some relationship no mere human relationship could satisfy? And when we find people who are disappointed in love and so on, we can tell them about the love that will not let them go and point them to Jesus. We can point them to the fact that sometimes it's our sin and self-reference and self-indulgence that's kept us from that relationship. And we can move them to how deep this relationship is that it wouldn't abandon them, but Christ came. And in the incarnation, he opened the, day, the, the door to reconciliation. Third longing. And it's the longing of human brokenness. The longing awakened by nature. Um, the longing, um, the romantic longing uh, uh, that the, uh, Lewis's um, hermit told John in that book. What Evelyn Underhill calls the longing of the ascetic saint. This is the longing that comes when we come to the place of the realization of our own brokenness. In, in, in the Romantic era, the Romantic authors were deeply concerned at the threshold of the Industrial Age because people were moving off of the farms and they were moving into the cities and the problems of the cities were beginning to emerge. Pollution was beginning to occur, and people were looking for what it was like in the old days when things were, were fresh, when things were closer to nature. Even, even Wordsworth, as he wrote his poetry, that romantic poet, he saw too as he aged, he was becoming more and more jaded and bitter, and he was longing for the lost innocence of his youth. And how do we recover? when we're broken people, when we recognize we want to fix what's broken in us. How many of you ever talk with people about Jesus and the hypocrisy issue comes up? I don't want anything to do with Jesus. There's too many hypocrites in the church. Am I the only one that's run into that? Yeah. Hundreds of times when I've had that discussion, I've, I've felt the door closing as a person talks about hypocrisy. And what I've found opens the door most dramatically is a willingness to let down my guard and talk about human brokenness honestly. And I'll say to that person, I think it's perceptive of you that you see that there's hypocrites in the church. And I think you're right. I'm ashamed of it, but I think you're right. You know how I know? They say, no, how? I say, I'm one. I believe in the high ideal of love. But I've had sharp words with people I say I love most in the world. I believe in justice, but there have been times I've been unfair in my treatment of others. I didn't set out to be, but I realized in retrospect I had been. No, you're right, there's hypocrites in the church. Hundreds of times I've had that conversation, taking that approach, with only one exception, everybody else in, entered into the vulnerability with me. And they said, well, when you put it like that, I'm a hypocrite too. Now we're two pilgrims on the same road. And I can say, what do you find helps you in times like that? They usually say, I haven't found anything. I struggle. I say, I struggle too, but you know what I'm finding helps me? They say, no what? And the door that was slammed now is open. 
and I have an opportunity to talk with them. And I share with them the gospel of the forgiveness of sin, the healing of brokenness, the process beginning to restore and rebuild the image of Christ. Well, we could go into more and more longings, but as you enter into conversations with people and you start asking them those questions and go deeper with them, what you'll find, I think, is that all around you are places where the doors are opening. You can't look at current events without seeing interesting things. I remember when 9-11 hit in America. That guy on Flight 93 that said, let's roll, when the passengers fought back the plane, the terrorist, and the plane went down. His name was Todd Beamer. He used to come to my house for Bible study. I knew Todd. I knew his wife, Lisa. He just got up one morning, lifted his head off the pillow to go do some work, and his head never rested on that pillow again. And all of us know people like that, who picked up their head and never rested again. And I, I caught myself saying, how can we be safe? But why do we have the expectation of safety? in this world. C.S. Lewis, in his, in his sermon that he preached at St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford University, said, war does not increase death. He could have said disease doesn't increase death. Accidents don't increase death. Aging doesn't increase death, because death is total in every generation. The world has never been safe. And we recognize that this is so. And as we begin to talk about it and we see people who are struggling with these sorts of things, we can say, do you want real safety? Do you want real security? And we appeal to that felt need and we talk about the security that we could have in Christ whose security transcends anything that we might experience in this life. On 9-11, I also caught myself saying, what is this day going to come to mean for us? We're still asking that question. But the real interest is, why do we want to make sense of our experience? What does that tell us about our nature and sense-making? And finally, as you talk to people and listen to them and discover their felt need, it's in that context you can tell them that the God of the universe loves you. He sent his son to forgive you of your sins, to reconcile you, you to, to him, to take care of the brokenness, to reconcile, to give you a sense of a relationship that will not let you go. And you can individually trust him. And you can even say to that person, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust him right now? And it's amazing when the person says, no, there's really no reason. You go, really? You know, you're shocked, you're surprised. But we don't need to be surprised. I am amazed when you bring the gospel to the place of felt need, how it unlocks the hunger of the heart and how the gospel message comes like a cup of cold water to a person who's starving and looking for hope. Anyway, I hope this is helpful to you as you seek to engage in the great high call of making the God of the universe who loves us and forgives us known to the people in the world around us. Any questions?